Hello everyone and welcome back to Perla Victoire, where we focus on historical, vintage, and modern sewing. Today I'll be making a cute little 1950s style summer top from Simplicity 1426 View C. I previously used this pattern to make View B and I'll link that video down below. This pattern is great for making vintage style play suits or swimsuits, and these crop tops will also look great with shorts or a skirt. I chose to make View C because it had these really cute little flippy flappies over the bust area. To me that feels like a quintessentially 1950s clothing detail and I was really curious to see how these were made so that I could apply them to future projects. Simplicity 1426 is a great pattern for using up scraps of fabric. So I used a bit of black and white houndstooth print cotton and some black cotton fabric for the lining and for the contrasting bits. I cut out a size 8, one size smaller than I usually use. The first step is to make the two darts in each cup. I marked the darts with chalk and pins. I like to place a pin perpendicular to the tip of the dart so that I can easily see where the dart ends when sewing it. Even though this top had a lot of pieces, it made up very quickly on the sewing machine. After stitching the darts and tying off the thread ends, I pressed the darts flat. I didn't see a need to trim these darts, and the instructions didn't mention it either. The dart placement on this pattern produced some ridiculously pointed cups. I'm not sure if this is an intentional feature of this 1950s top, so I'm not making any changes to the dart fit and placement. The UC has these cute flaps that go over the bust cups. Interestingly, the flaps are cut on the bias, but the pattern instructs you to add interfacing to them which would reduce the ease and flexibility you'd get from cutting these on the bias. I ignored the instructions and didn't add interfacing to these. Each flap gets folded in half and pinned to the outside top edge of a cup. The instructions said to baste these together, but I just sewed them together without basting. Next, I matched up the center front edges and pinned them together making sure the bottom darts are moved out of the way. The front edges were stitched together, leaving 5 eighths of an inch unsewn at the top and bottom edges of the cups. Leaving this seam allowance unstitched now will make it easier to attach the bottom band and lining later. The seam allowances of the center front seam get pressed down, always an important step when sewing. The band that goes underneath the cups gets reinforced with some lightweight iron-on interfacing. When I apply interfacing, I press firmly down on my iron to make sure the interfacing is thoroughly adhered to the fabric. Now we're ready to attach the cups to the front band. I pin these together, matching up the curved bottom edge of the cups with the sloped top edge of the band. When I get to the center front, I fold down the center front seam allowances and then attach the band over the folded seam allowances. This seam allowance here will spread out a bit to accommodate the shape of the band. Then I sewed these pieces together on my sewing machine. I also trimmed and clipped the seam allowances to help everything lay smoothly. It was a little tricky to navigate around that center point, but I think I managed to make it look neat and, well, pointy. The back panels of this garment are also interfaced for extra structure. The back panels are pinned, right sides together, to the side edges of the bodice. This seam is sewn and then pressed flat. These steps are repeated on the lining fabric, except for the cup flaps. Sew the darts, sew the cups together at the center front, attach the front band, and sew the back panels to the bodice front. The seams of the lining get carefully trimmed and clipped to help reduce bulk. Then the lining is pinned to the top edge of the outer bodice, right sides together. The center front seam allowances remain folded down, and then the lining and outer are sewn together. Next, the seam allowances along the top edge are trimmed down. 
I generally like to trim the interfaced pieces to be shorter to make the seam less bulky. To help the curves of the top edge lay nicely, triangular notches are cut in the seam allowance. Next, the seam allowances will be stitched to the lining fabric, which is called understitching. This technique helps keep the lining fabric from rolling to the front. I find it easier to first pin the seam allowances to the lining, then set my sewing machine to its lowest speed so that I can stitch as close as possible to the original seam. The next step is to turn the bodice pieces right side out and press them flat. The pattern instructions then say to turn the bodice inside out again and sew the bottom edges together and then somehow turn the whole bodice right side out by pulling it through the center back edge. I dislike this approach because I feel like it's unnecessarily difficult to turn the bodice right side out. And it's even more tricky to press it flat after sewing. Instead, I fold it up and press the 5 8 of an inch seam allowance along the bottom edge of the outer bodice and lining. I also cut notches into the seam allowance at this point, as I wouldn't be able to do so after top stitching the lining and outer fabrics together. I also turned in the center back edges by 5 8 of an inch, and I trimmed away the extra seam allowances in this area. I pin these edges together and then top stitch them on my sewing machine. For an invisible finish, you could also whip stitch these edges together by hand. It is much easier in my experience to sew these edges together from the outside than to sew them from the inside and turn everything out. This top fastens with two buttons at the center back. Following the markings on the pattern, I made two buttonholes on my sewing machine. I like to add fray check to my buttonholes before I slice them open, just to reinforce the buttonholes a bit. I then sewed on two buttons on the other back bodice piece. When I sew on buttons, I like to keep a pin underneath the button to help give the threads holding the buttons some ease. I find this makes it easier to fasten the buttons later. After stitching on a button, I wrap the thread underneath the button a few times then backstitch the thread underneath the button to secure it. VUC includes halter straps that button onto the bodice. These straps can be removed to make the bodice strapless. I find halter straps really uncomfortable, so instead I lengthen the straps so that they could cross over my back and button to the back of the top as well. I marked where the straps could comfortably attach on the back of the bodice and made machine sewn buttonholes there. I cut out the lengthened straps from black cotton fabric to match the black flappy bits over the cups. Each strap gets folded in half lengthwise, then stitched for the 3 8 of an inch seam allowance, leaving one of the short ends unstitched. The seam allowances are carefully trimmed away, and then it's time for my least favorite sewing task, turning these skinny tubes inside out. I used a safety pin secured to one end of the tube to turn these out. If I make this bodice again, I'll instead sew the straps by folding in the seam allowances and top stitching from the right side of the fabric. Next, the remaining open edge of the straps was finished by folding in the seam allowance and sewing the edge closed by hand with a whip stitch. Then I sewed small black buttons onto each end of both straps. I made the straps with extra length just in case I need to adjust them in the future. The straps are long enough that I can tie them into a halter or cross them on my back, and I can easily remove the straps altogether from the bodice if desired. This pattern cleverly hides the buttonholes for the front straps underneath the bust flaps. Even though this bodice buttons in the back, I'm still able to put it on by myself. I really appreciate the convertible aspect of this top, and I'll be using this button-on strap method for future dresses and tops. The only alteration I'll make is stitching part of the buttonholes closed. I think I either made them too big, 
or the fabric stretched and relaxed. And after a few wears, the buttoned on straps don't feel as secure as they should. Overall, Simplicity 1426 is a super quick and easy pattern. I whipped up this top in a few hours and have worn it a lot since I made it. The style is really cute and it's a great way to use scraps of fun fabrics. I can wear this top with a bra or without, but without the cuffs are too big. Maybe next time I'll use interfacing on the fabric here or flat line with a thicker fabric for more structure. Trying a small bust adjustment may also help. I think this pattern is drafted for a B or even C cup because the bust area is quite roomy. I'm considering this version a wearable mock-up, and I'm excited to make a few more of these vintage tops, especially as some coordinated sets with shorts and skirts to make vintage style play suits. Let me know in the comments down below if you've ever made something from Simplicity 1426, or if you've made some kind of summery, vintage inspired top like this. And if you have, feel free to share it with me on Instagram by tagging me at Thorla Victoire. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, feel free to give it a like and subscribe for more historical, vintage, and modern sewing content. Bye.